All right. So good seeing you guys again. I guess you guys forgot. My name is Estelle Linda. I am your librarian. My job title is research services and social sciences librarian. You could also just call me Estella and I'll answer. So I want to thank you for coming for Band Book Week. Band Book Week, Books Week, is an annual event that celebrates the freedom to read with the purpose of placing a spotlight on the harms of censorship. This annual event is celebrated by librarians, booksellers, publishers, journalists, teachers, and readers. It is now my pleasure to introduce Carmen. So we are doing a collab, the library and a few other organizations. African American Studies Department is one of them. The Diasporic People's Writing Collective is another one. For those of you who picked up a book, you'll have a bookmark uh, for DPWC, which is Diasporic People's Writing Collective. It is a a uh, registered student organization here on campus. And there are a few bookmarks in the back too. You may help yourself to a book. It's seldom that the university gives you something as wonderful and valuable as this. So um, take advantage. Uh, of course, I am here to push your love of literature, narrative, stories, reading, and in this case, the genre of poetry in which those narratives will be told. Um, we will have a wonderful student introducing our guest, Daniel B. Summerhill. So I will introduce our lovely student. This is Rahel, and Rahel is um, a global studies major. She is minoring in philosophy. Um, she is also taking classes through the African American Studies Department here at San Jose State. And she has high hopes of pulling together global studies and education into a career to make a change for not only us, but just the world, the globe. Um, she has been honored as a Gilman Scholar, and she is also a member of the sorority, AKA. Take it away, Rahel. <laughs> okay. Lovely to see you all. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you as well. Um, Daniel B. Summerhill is a poet and essayist who earned fellowships from Baldwin for the Arts and The Watering Hole. He is inaugural part, uh, poet uh, laureate of Monterey County, County and has published two collections of poem, poems, Divine, 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 2021, and Mausoleum of Flowers, 2022. His poems and essays appear in the Academy of American Poets, the Progressive Columbia Journal, Obsidian, the Walmart Street Journal, and elsewhere. An Oakland native, Bay Area represent. Um, Daniel lives in the Bay Area and is an assist assistant professor of poetry at Santa Clara University. Um, please give a warm welcome to our guest today. Check, check. Uncle, do you want to fight? Uncle, come on, let's fight. A question my nephew has asked me since he could talk. Must be Cain, Triple H, and The Undertaker influencing him to want to brawl sporadically. I never stopped to think that maybe, well, maybe Elijah had more pent up emotion than a child should. Maybe he mixed up fireball, quarrel, and reprisal. Maybe Elijah is angry at the universe for its ignorance about him on January 21st. 1999, circa 9.45 p.m. he was born. A seven pound, two ounce miracle Elijah came out of the womb, asked first, and society has looked at him backwards ever since. The first time I held him, I could feel the weight of his heart and the density of his mind. Elijah has been diagnosed with autism for as long as I can remember. Elijah, you're one of a kind. God handpicked you to be different carefully crafted each of your neurons to function like fluttering wings of butterflies. Symphonic hymns that float to ability to be captured, Elijah. Never let them tell you you're sick or crippled or flawed. Your brain is just too complex for them to comprehend. Never let them shock your thoughts like precious stars imprisoned there. This world has progressed on the spines of people as beautiful as you. A spectrum of autistic genius, Einstein, Jackson, Mozart, Bob Dylan, Warhol, Elijah. They've mistaken artistic for autistic. Misdiagnosed the heaven and your heartbeat when did poetry cease to be an accepted language? 
When do my nephew's words become too shiftless, too falsetto to be understood? Mass education marked by marginalization is manipulation. This is for every person that's ever been called retard, special, slow, crippled, crazy, derpy, dumb freaks are feeble minded for those naturally rebel firework frame torsos that have been classified as disease. Our lust for conformity has left our creativity behind, but nephew, you are new. You are powerful. You are exuberant. You are masterful. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Never let them, Christopher Columbus, a mind that God already lives in. May your voice be as free as your ancestors once were. Speak with the courage we've all abandoned. Live big, live gorgeous, live on purpose. And the next time you ask me to fight, I'll say, yeah. Yeah, Elijah. We'll fight this unappreciative world together, just you and me, one day at a time. Y'all can clap, snap, you can throw money, you can do a dance. Any of those things are cool. First of all, um, uh, much love to you all for being here. I know it's partly maybe a requirement for class or for credit. Uh, I still appreciate y'all showing up nonetheless. Um, thanks to Carmen, uh, Stella, uh, Josephine, um, and the other person's name was, shout it out. Nope, we're, we're held to, but there was one more. Starts with an H, Hard, Harleen. Much love to all y'all uh, for, for all your work in, in making this thing happen. Um, I'm gonna talk about some poems. And also because this is unbanned, uh, you know, the unbanned and, and banned book week, um, I think it was fitting to begin with a poem about my nephew. Um, uh, his name is Elijah, obviously. Uh, and he had been told that he wasn't beautiful or gorgeous or any of those things uh, growing up. So I decided to to speak some truths about him. Um, and I think at the core of what the this idea of banning books is about is erasing or kind of withholding truths. And so my talk um, and then the poems we'll check out all revolve around this idea of truth and truth telling as um, the duty of, of, of a poet. Um, all right. Let me jump in. So I'll begin with a, a quick story. So in 2018, um, the US Embassy invited me to travel to Durban, South Africa, which is um, the southern, uh, I guess, southeastern kind of tip of, of Africa. Um, the National International Poetry As uh, Africa Festival. It brings together poets from all over the world, right? So there are folks from Nigeria, Botswana, Spain, um, Canada, uh, England, um, and a bunch of other places. And I spent much of my time when I wasn't teaching or enjoying uh, the amazing food, um, walking with poets along the Southern Ocean, which is an amazing sight, by the way. Um, in fact, uh, my hotel room overlooked the Southern Ocean. And in the mornings, the sun was huge. And I know like you all have probably seen a sunrise uh, before, but because this is the Southern Ocean, the sun, literally takes up the entire sky. And it looks like it's coming out of the, the water, which is a, a glorious thing. Um, anyways, I would take walks with this person uh, who they call the Maya Angelou of South Africa. Her name is Lina Kope. And uh, in Zulu, uh, which is the native tongue of South Africa, they have clicks in their, um, in their language and her name has a click. So it's Lina Kope. Um, we talked about a lot of things life, poetry, what it was like to kind of sustain poetry, a poetic career for, for all these years. When I asked her why she wrote poems, she responded by saying, what other way to praise God? Now, one way to interpret this on his face, uh, especially since South Africa is heavily colonized and had been heavily colonized, um, and especially as it relates to what kind of Western religious practices um, is, is kind of quite literal, right? Uh, but what I gathered from our talk and her response was that God represented the truth. The only truth, the absolute truth, the only thing a writer can be after is this idea of the truth. This being or not that some of us subscribe to is something we cannot conceive of, but dedicate our lives, our thoughts, our salvation to this idea of pursuing the truth. To be a Christian in search of God in some ways, I know I grew up a Christian, I was raised in a church, uh, but for Kina Gope, this also means writing to always be in search of some truth, even if truth is spelled God. Now, I want to ground this a little bit. So here's an excerpt from a book called Social Poetics by Mark Nowak. 
Langston Hughes, no doubt reflecting on his own wide ranging political activities in and about the Jim Crow era uh, in America during the first half of the 20th century once described what he felt to be a central difference between the social poet and those poets who were more exclusively concerned with aesthetics and craft. He said, I have never known the police of any country to show interest in lyric poetry as such. But when poems stop talking about the moon and begin to talk about poverty, trade unions, color lines, and colonies, somebody tells the police. Hughes' crucial essay, published in W.E.B. Du Bois' File on Magazine in 1947, is titled, My Adventures as a Social Poet. Hughes described his early poems as social poems because they were about people's problems, whole groups of people's problems rather than their own personal difficulties. And as he reminds his readers in his essay, the moon belongs to everyone, not this America earth of ours. That is perhaps why poems about the moon perturb to no one, but poems about color and poverty do perturb many citizens. Social forces pull backwards or forwards, right or left, and social poems get caught in the pulling and hauling. Sometimes the poet himself gets pulled and hauled off even to jail. In fact, there's numbers of examples of poets being persecuted for speaking the truth. Nigerian American poet Chris Abani uh, was imprisoned uh, for his work in speaking out against a corrupt government in Nigeria. Allen Ginsberg's How got him into a great deal of trouble. And across the water, when Joseph Stalin came into power, his first act was to kill off all the poets. Um, because poets um, have the, the duty of telling the truth. And truth, of course, is counter to someone like a dictator such as Joseph Stalin. Hughes is arguing for the practice of writing to chronicle and to make aware of the conditions of the people. The people meaning the collective, not the individual, or the writer solely considered with aesthetics for aesthetic sake. So here's a thesis, y'all. Here's a thesis of this thing. Any writers in the room? No writers? Zero writers in this room. All right, I'm talking to y'all, but the rest of y'all can listen. You ever been to like a banquet or a banquet celebration? I know you, most of you have. The banquet celebrations, um, you're there to celebrate, you know, one person, but the rest of everybody else gets to like participate and eat the good food. That's what y'all are about to do. So whoever the writer is, I'm talking to you and the rest of y'all get to just kind of listen to the good stuff, all right? So here it is, writers, you have a duty as a writer, especially as a poet, whether you consciously choose to fulfill it or acknowledge it, it exists. You have this duty because you decided to be a writer, someone dedicated to keeping, wrestling with, and pushing language. Language being the most important asset we have as human beings. Why? Because it is how we know we exist, how we know we are alive. Our only way of translating informations, triumphs, struggles, without language, we have no way of describing self-awareness and metacognition. And therefore, if you are a writer, your duty is to tell the truth because without telling the truth, we die. I mean that in both a figurative sense and a literal sense. You are self-preserving when you tell the truth. Writing, languaging is self-preservation. Poetry, nonfiction, and yes, even fiction is rooted in truth. Writing is about the truth, and that is the responsibility. Before I began teaching at Santa Clara University, I taught at California State University, Monterey Bay, in the Creative Writing and Social Action Program, <clears throat> the only one in the country that has a, a social action piece embedded. One semester on the second day of classes, a student tells me she wrote a poem or she writes poems in order to change the world. And I told her that's asking a hell of a lot of a poem. The student was not present on the day of class, the first day of class when I do all of my poetry classes by beginning and saying the poem is not enough, but telling the truth might lead to some collective shift in consciousness or some global change of mind. And then humans as an organism, um, because that's what we are, right? A singular organism might pivot from such infraction. We as an organism only have instances of cancer, the cancer being a microcosm of something on the macro level, relatable to colonization or mass incarceration or global pandemics, so on and so on. So the poet's job 
is to tell the truth in hopes that that line might help someone or might help the collective shift its consciousness to a place of righteousness. And once, once it does, the poem shouldn't be celebrated, nor should the poet. The poet is but merely a cell within the organism working on behalf of the whole. Like anyone else, as poets, the obligation is to tell the truth. Now, I realize this may sound a bit romantic or grandiose, so to clarify, what I mean is not that poets are somehow oracles with all the answers. To the contrary, poets don't have all the answers, but it is their moral and I'd argue professional duty to be in a constant quest towards some truth. So it should be of no shock when I tell you that the poem is not enough. The poem is not enough. Okay, I know, I know you've probably been sitting there wondering like what the truth is, right? You're talking about this truth, which I'm not sure any of us have the answer for, but Baldwin, James Baldwin, uh, advises, we do indeed know what a lie is. So although we do not know what the truth is, we can recognize a lie. And James Baldwin uh, says, all the problems we deal with in the United States especially stem from America's lie, its original lie. And that lie is when colonizers came to America, they could recognize a man as a man, but decided to call that man anything but a man. And everything we're dealing with now stems from that original uh, that original lie, right? Okay, what an exciting and terrifying it is to be a writer, right? Always in constant quest of, of truth. Um, but Baldwin says nobody in their right mind becomes a writer, right? But then you discover you are one and you don't have a choice. Um, and the lower division creative writing course I taught at CSUMB, a student uh, you know, stayed behind and, and asked how I knew I wanted to be a writer. She, um, she said, Professor Summerhill, can you give me, you know, uh, the quick story on how you know you, knew you wanted to be a, a poet? So I gave the most condensed version that I could, you know, um, do. And she says, well, I'm not sure if I want to be a writer or a poet. And I say, why not? And she says, when I write, sometimes it scares me. And I said, well, it's a little too late then if, uh, if you're already at that point, right? because poetry forces you to kind of face things. Writing requires you to face things that you might not otherwise face, especially about yourself. Keith Lehman says, the struggle in and of itself has meaning. Toni Morrison says, the only way to avoid the hand of God is to get in it. James Baldwin says, if you're scared of death, to walk towards it. Writing forces you to see things and confront things about yourself. So writing is no revolutionary act, but telling the truth is. The craft of telling the truth, an excavation through the mundane, through the people, through the communal, through society, that's how the best poems, the best pieces of writing are articulated. Okay, enough talk. Uh, Josephine, Harlene, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and get in the poems up there for me, please. We're gonna take a look at some poems, y'all. They're gonna be good poems, I promise. All right, so at the top is a poem by Walt Whitman, written in 1860, all right? It's called, I Hear America Singing. I hear America singing, the very carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be, blith and strong. The carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam. The mason singing as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat. The deckhand singing on the steamboat deck. The shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench. The hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter song. The plowboy's on his way in the morning or at noon in her mission or at sundown. The delicious singing of the mother or of the young wife at work or the girl sewing or washing, each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. The day what belongs to the day. At night, the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths, their strong, melodious songs. When do we sing, y'all? When do y'all sing? Just shout it out. When do y'all sing? In the shower, definitely in the shower. When else? Church, 
what what is your your general mood when you're singing? I know you can sing when like you're sad and all that, but like for the sake of this, when do you sing? You're happy. It's a joyful thing, right? So tonally, this Walt Woman poem is is uplifting, right? It's happy. It's joyful, right? All these folks doing their jobs are happy they're doing their jobs, right? The boatman, the the shoemaker, the woodcutter, they're all singing, right? Y'all know what battle rap is? Anybody heard of battle rap? Raise your hand if you heard of battle rap. So battle rap, for folks that do, uh, don't know, aren't familiar, basically two rappers kind of go head to head and usually um, it's kind of response to, to one another, right? They'll um, do research on the other person, the other rapper, they'll respond to the other rapper, they use, you know, um, you know, uh, jokes, personal personalized jokes, um, and really kind of cap or try to dig into the other person, right? But a large part of it is conversational, right? So I have a theory that Langston Hughes came 60 years later. Uh, you can scroll up, please. Langston Hughes, 60 years later, came along and said, yo, hold on, Walt Whitman. I hear and see uh, this, this America of yours, right? Where the shoemaker is singing and the boat, you know, the boatman is singing, et cetera. But I don't see myself reflected in... Um, in those songs, right? So Langston Hughes came along 60 years later and said, I have another truth to kind of add to the mix. I too, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. What's Langston Hughes's tone or, or emotion or mood right here, y'all? What do you think? Just shout it out. Not happy, Will? So we're not happy, definitely not in the beginning, right? Because he's been sent to eat in the kitchen, right? Because he's the darker brother. But then what happens? We get, uh, we get this. What is this? What is this laughter about? Is something funny? None's funny. So what's the tone of that laugh then? Hopeful, in spite, rebellious perhaps, right? I laugh and I eat well and grow strong. And then tomorrow, and tomorrow signifies what, y'all? A future. Tomorrow quite literally just signifies a future, a hope, something new, right? A new day. Tomorrow, I'm going to be at the kitchen. They're not going to say eat in the kitchen then, right? And not only that, but they're going to see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. All right, scroll down a little bit more. The only person to ever win a Pulitzer Prize for a rap album, his name is Kendrick Lamar, and he wrote a song called I. A part of that song, you can go a little bit further. Right there, cool. A part of that song is excerpted here, all right? This is an excerpt from I, which was written 60 years later, right, or roughly 60 years later. They want to say it's a war outside, bomb in the street, gun in the hood, mob of police, rock on the corner with the line for the fiend and a bottle for the lean and a model on a schema. These days of frustration keep y'all on tucking rotation. I duck these cold faces, post up fifafo from bases, dreams of reality's peace, blow steam in the face of the beast. Sky could fall down, wind could cry now. Look at me, motherfucker, I smile. What's Kendrick Lamar's tone, emotion, thoughts in this piece, y'all? What y'all think? Talk to me. Is Kendrick Lamar happy here? What y'all think? Come on, shout it out. There's like a hundred of y'all. Somebody surely knows what's happening in this Kendrick Lamar song. Angry, there's an anger, yup. What else? What else? Exhausted, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yep, the sky could fall down, right? The wind could cry, but I'm I'm smiling, right? So there's a resilience even in this piece too, right? All right, scroll up, please. A poet by the name of Noor Hindi wrote this poem in 2020. Uh, we're talking about the truth, right? Colonizers write about flowers. I tell you about children throwing rocks at Israeli tanks seconds before becoming daisies. I want to be like those poets who care about the moon. Palestinians don't see the moon from jail cells and prisons. It's so beautiful, the moon. They're so beautiful, the flowers. I pick flowers for my dead father when I'm sad. He watches Al Jazeera all day. I wish Jessica would stop texting me, happy Ramadan. 
I know I'm American because when I walk into a room, something dies. Metaphors about death are for poets who think ghosts care about sound. When I die, I promise to haunt you forever. One day, I'll write about the flowers like we own them. We're talking truth, right? Keep scrolling. All these poets are telling the truth, speaking the truth, thinking about truth, right? Apologies. This is Denez Smith. Less hope. Apologies. I was a part of the joy industrial complex. Told them their bodies were miracles and they ate it. Sold someday, made money off soon and now. I snuck an ode into the elegy, forced the dead to smile and juke, implied America, said destroy, but offered nary step nor tool. I paid taxes knowing where the funds go. In April, my offering to my mother's slow murder. By May, my sister filled with the bullets I bought. June, and my father's life locked into a box I built. My brother's in plotted as I spin. I don't know why I told you it would be okay. Not, won't. When they aren't killing you, they're killing someone else. Sometimes their hands at the ends of your wrist. You, you and me, are agents and enemy. There I was writing anthems in a nation whose victory was my blood made visible. My mother too, sugar to, my mother too sugar to weep without melting. My rage, a comfort, foaming at my racial mouth, singing gospel for a God they beat in, me into loving. Lord, your tomorrow holds no sway. Your heaven's too late. I've abandoned you as you me. For me, say la vie. But sweet Satan, OG dark kicked out the sky first fallen and niggered thing. What's good? Who owns it? Where does it come from? Satan, first segregation, mother of exile. What do you promise in your fire for our freedom? I offer over their souls, theirs, mine is mine. I refuse any hell again. I've known it nearer devils, the audience in the mirror. They, I, made you look weak. They, I, clapped at my eulogies. They, I, said encore, encore. I, we, wanted to stop being killed. And they, I, thanked me for my beauty. And pitifully, I love them. I thank them. I took the awards and cashed the checks. I did the one about the boy when requested. I traded their names for followers. In lieu of action, I wrote a book. Edited my war cries down to prayers. Oh, devil, they gave me a god and gave me clout. They took my poems and took my blades. Satan, like you did for God, I sang. I sang for my enemy, who was my god. I gave it my best. I bowed and smiled. Teach me to never bend again. Denez Smith is ex an extremely accomplished poet, right? Won a bunch of book awards, etc. Denez said, wait a minute, what am I doing, right, with my writing? As Langston Hughes said, right, there's a difference between the poet that's concerned with just aesthetics, right, and craft, and the poet that's concerned with people and what people are dealing with, thinking about, struggling with. Denez said, I've won these awards, but that's just me shucking and jiving for someone who um, is killing, imprisoning my family, essentially, right? So he did a, a, a look in the mirror, so to speak, right, with this poem. Okay, scroll down. What's after this one? Is that it? That's it. Perfect. All right. I'm going to read some poems now, okay? How about that? I'm going to read a poem about my grandfather, and I'm actually going to switch to this microphone. Can y'all hear me here? Cool. I write a lot about my grandfather because I never met my dad. He was, um, my grandfather was the portrait of a man for me. Uh, and he passed away. He was born in 1926 and passed away in 2016. So he lived to be 90 years old. What a life, right? This is Sunday in Oakland. You ask about the weather outside in an attempt to stretch our visit. And for the next 22 minutes, flax and leaves smother the ground. The clouds are selfless. And Oakland is golden today, like all other days, because Oakland measures its weather by the number of black bodies basking in the sun around Lake Merritt. By now, the most complicated thing you can remember of me is my name. 
and how it forces your tongue to press against the roof of your mouth twice before the tension in your jaw is released. It is your only exercise. Routinely, you spend your time in bed until you don't. And then, like a moment at attention, the day is as grand as you allow. Oxfords, where the creases excavate themselves into a groove a pork pie crown and a shirt that you ironed collar first for your trip to reveal your bag of chia seeds and other items your VA doctor recommended mostly aimed at preservation of a body that broke in 43 during the swing of the allies fist. Your power chair hoist a flag that isn't red, white, and blue, but is as American as Jim Crow, and you and what's left of the 92nd Infantry clasp onto your buffaloes as if they're the only thing you've claimed as your own. It's Sunday, and if there was a day of the week to sink into yourself, it would have to be the Lord's Day, no matter your position to God. You are no exception to this rule. You sit at the edge of a bed that is also half machine and ask me to turn the TV down before, in a swift motion, you bring your legs to rest on your mattress. Their stiff landing, the last thing I hear from you, and your breathing slows, almost still. Your nasal passages soften as if rehearsing how to leave gently. And I am reminded how some stars we admire don't exist anymore. How by the time we have praised them, they've already shrapneled into God's palms. <sighs> again, y'all don't have to like snap. It's not like a jazz club. In fact, um, Again, y'all can stand up, dance, shout. If you like a line, you can repeat it. Uh, I come from the oral tradition of blackness, right? And we are very audible people. So if you're feeling something, you can say so. Or again, you could throw money too. That's also a possibility. Sitting in a worker chair against floral wallpaper in Oakland heat. There is a portrait of Huey Newton in my church. It's communion Sunday and mama has on her good shoes with the gold links. The Jackson boys are dressed to the nines. Their pants starch creased and hovering above their snake skins like halos. Huey's in a black beret, but gone anyway. What's blood without a body to show for it? In the States, what's more righteous than a gun and a spear sitting at the left hand of God on a worker chair in Oakland? Worker chair out front since before COINTELPRO bludgeoned the Panthers. We've come because it's Easter and we're hungry. Inside, Marvin Gaye's falsetto seeps in like a gentle flood and the kitchen becomes a small soul train line for 12 minutes instead. All these bodies bending like prayer. Black means religion is second only to dancing. The day America stormed America, I was black and in exile for yanking a tulip from the ground. I shouldn't have but wanted something more beautiful to die before I did. Call it civil disobedience. I'm just gonna keep going. On Preservation, featuring C.P. Bannon, begins with an epigraph from Hanif Abdurraqib, which says, our grief decides when it is done with us. Tell me there's a poem on both sides of this barrel, body cocked and nuanced and a canvas awaiting the shrapnel's careful decision, both craving immortality. I wanna say something about East 14th and how it stretches its arms from the gut of Oakland to forever. For those I care, that is the longevity I crave. I pass by 12 liquor stores on my way to the liquor store. I pass by seven churches on my way to church. Sir, from the etymology of conservancy means to protect, as in observatory or self-preservation, like Huey holding a 45 on the steps of the Capitol. A street is still a street if it is renamed. A bullet is still a bullet inside a throat. Remember, telling the truth is an act of self-guarding. I forget how to write a poem on my way to writing a poem. On the day the sun is showing its good side, we spill out a CP Bannon like a torrent. My grandfather tells me the only way for the fallen to live longer is at a funeral, and he resembles a love more materialized than mine, so I believe him. 
says the more people that attend, the longer he'll last. So I show up. Remember, a mortuary is a congregation with the task of preserving the dead. Tell me it's another way to be saved. I want to say something about the dove and immortality, how we cast our collective gaze towards an infinite horizon stretched above a row of big body American cars running from CP Bannon to forever, how preservation is now the responsibility of the bird its wings palming the sky before it cascades into blue. Remember, a gavel is a bullet first and everything else second. I say boundless and mean, the dove is no dove at all, but a homing pigeon, hoping to make it back to its cage before it is released again. I say infinity and mean, they came from me that morning and you that night. Mm -hmm. I'm reading new stuff now. Yeah. I got a, a working on a new project. So this is new stuff. But the first several poems are from Mausoleum of Flowers, Carmen. This next poem is called All My Prayers Sound Like a Chief Keef Record after Hanif Abdurraki. Near 152, the reservoir has no water. Well, amen. Where I'm from, a group of Black folks is a two step or a funeral, a circadian rhythm a small slaughter. 43 miles to 152, a balloon in the draft says it must return home before the streetlights come on. A boy tells me he believes in God because his mother didn't die when she was choked to death. While peeling a pomegranate, my uncle's words, nothing good comes without hard work. I can't recall if this was before or after his body burst into a field of hydrangeas my mother coaxing my tears into a small offering. The soil shimmers, a mausoleum of new. I don't know death, only grief. If I don't sleep, tomorrow will come anyways. I apologize. I'm not in the business of disproving miracles. If we're protesting death, it's too late. If we're looking for God, it's too soon. I apologize. Heaven has all my favorite people and the dead don't desire justice, only ghosts. And when they leave, even their shadows got a sound to them. Praise Frank Ocean's falsetto, Moon River's second chorus dangling from the chord progression like a tiny poltergeist. Praise the ghosts that keep me suspended between here and somewhere holier. Praise the pallbearers, how the dead are responsible for preserving the dead. Praise Jimmy Cigarette tapping like Morse code. Praise no name in the street and all of its cousins. Praise the scaffold. Praise the hand. Off Highway 1, there is a place where calla lilies run away into the ocean. The waves freestyle their horizon. In this story, the boy is a blade. I apologize. All my prayers sound like a Chief Keef record. Some I love are dead. Some I love eulogize themselves by dancing to their childhood names. Will you hold my hand while the water rises? Will you fall to your knees for prayer? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Carmen. <laughs> All right, a couple more poems, y'all. This one is about Martin Luther King. And when James Baldwin and Martin Luther King were very close. Uh, and um, James Baldwin was heartbroken, of course, when Martin Luther King was assassinated. So I wrote this poem uh, as a persona poem. So it's speaking as if I, the, the speaker in the poem is James Baldwin. All right called Bop. The journalist asked Jimmy what it was like when Martin died. Well, I suppose we could spend more time pretending I bought a new suit for Carnegie Hall. Bought a new suit for the occasion. Bought a new suit with dues from Paris. Yes, it's true. He pays a price for an America which still leaves a balance. Well, I have a future held in the lungs of this thundering silence, this sleeping giant. Lord, when you send the rain, think about it. Please, a little. Lord, Dorothy still navigates a crowd like the devil's bullet surrounded by saints dressed in all white. Oh yes, I weep now. Yes, I weep again. Word is, they're hurling prayers in the air hoping something sticks. I find myself amongst this mess on the floor. 
staggering the fissured healing ground. Lord, there's soot all over the alabaster and they're calling it a revolution. Lord, the mule they promised us is pulling Martin's wagon to the grave. Lord, when you send the rain, think about it, please, a little. Well, I suppose the next thing to do is lie down here on this dirt road in the path of that old sweet chariot, wishing for it to swing down and carry us home. Precious Lord, here is your song in a strange land. Lord, what does it mean to repent in despair? Lord, what does it mean to lie in repentance? I know why we are still here. I've grown weary in the week. Lord, send the rain. Okay, and lastly, uh, this is called Flood. And it's kind of a uh, an alternative spin on the, of course, the the famous story of Noah's Ark, right? It's a flood. Look, Noah was short a bird and threw my ancestor in the boat instead. This is how the black swan got its melanin. How they call us unprecedented now, unpredictable even. God left the sky running and said he'd never do it again. It's always the arrogant ones that make mistakes. It's always the animal with wings trying for freedom that suffers the most. The homies don't know words like antediluvian, but can nail a jumper anywhere 28 feet in. Malik can make the metal net sound like a wind chime in a storm. Wrist raised like a Doppler. We knew the outcome by the angle of his arm. Malik, the geometrist. Malik, the physicist. Malik, the god of rain. Once, during the playoffs, Malik hit four in a row and sent the crowd to the rafters, everyone clasping hands with the person beside them, everyone air suspended like a held breath, which is to say, we didn't need an ark to float. Circa 1998, Victor's trembling ankles anchor him to the edge of the slide. The water waits. Imagine watching your friend attempt to take flight in search of his father. Hurt is always on the cusp tilted more towards us like the Earth's axis slow nodding to the moon. He let go and got wings. The waves teach me to surrender the way he did, crashing through the water, death nodding back. Another flood, always the wings, making ghosts of black boys, its own kind of destruction. Once upon a time, People were stolen and dropped off in the middle of the ocean, on the coast of someone else's land, in the middle of someone else's deeper hell, and have been treading the fire since. Usually, they call a boat of fleeting people, fleeing death, immigrants, or if you're from South America, aliens. But some folks love a good epic, so for magical realism's sake, we'll call it a miracle. The end is a long exercise in patience. On the 40th day, Noah sent out the dove and it came back with hope in its beak. At the vigil we held for the migrants who didn't make it, we released the doves, they never returned. Legend has it, there's a rainbow gushing out of Grizzly Peak, East Oakland's rugged crown, drowners at its steep feet, juvenescence jigsaw piled into whichever ill-equipped ride we could negotiate, a scraper, Park Avenue, Le Sabre, or any other General Electric car born before we were. We ascend to find the beginning of the colors, blunts in hands. We aim to get high. We don't wait for God's generosity. We peel back the clouds. Up here, after 8 p.m., even a citywide graveyard looks like a pot of gold. I'm not saying there is a God, but we jumped into the flood without knowing how to swim and waded in the water or sipped it through the cracks on the ocean floor. In the photo, a black boy is holding another black boy and out the mouth of the small one's chest is a beam. And I know no other way to compute retribution than black folks being old heaven and only having to say amen for it. I'll stop there. Thank you all for your attention. And I think we're doing some questions, right? Okay, I'm gonna go uh, questions, comments. We can rap about anything y'all like. Frank Ocean, how Blonde is one of the greatest albums of all time. Um, any of that stuff. How Baby Keem has a 
illustrious rhyme scheme with alternative slant rhymes. What y'all want to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. What's up, man? <laughs> Jamal, I work in our Office of Diversity. Uh, I'm Jamal Williams. I work in our Office of Diversity. I also play basketball with Daniel every Sunday. We're on the team. We're in the finals this Sunday. Root for us. Um, my question, sir, is as I walked in a little late, all the poems I heard had a, a, a very spiritual influence. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about where that comes from and how you chose to infuse that into uh, your work? Yo, um, so I grew up in the church, right? Grew up a non-denominational Christian, uh, mostly because like, a lot of black folks, we're just, that's, you're indoctrinated into that. You go into church Sunday, sometimes two, three times on Sunday. Um, and then Wednesdays, Bible study, Thursdays is choir rehearsal and all that jazz, right? Um, but as I grew up, um, I was also interested in like figuring out like what that meant for me and um, in wrestling with and challenging um, all the stuff that I was kind of force fed. And so I think my poems, you know, when spirituality comes up, religion comes up, God comes up um, in the poems, I think that's largely just my, me trying to wrestle with what, what all that means, right? And, and in fact, the Bible says, like, challenge me, question me, right? Like, don't take any word. And y'all are college students. Y'all should be doing this every day, all the time, challenging each other, challenging the professors, um, because that's how growth happens. That's how you, you know, you, you, you know, come about knowledge um, through kind of wrestling with, with ideas and things. Um, so Jamal, I think to answer your question, um, that's really just me trying to wrestle with, uh, you know, what I was, what I was kind of spoon fed growing up. Yeah. Thanks for the question. What else? Yeah. Beside being from Oakland, why is that city so significant and why is it so prominent in your work? Is this rebellious? Oakland is always like, nah, like straight up. So there's, um, Oakland's changing, right? As y'all probably all know, uh, they got North Oakland back in like the 80s and 90s, 2000s. Uh, they're heavily working on West Oakland now because there's a Whole, Food, Whole Foods. Whenever there's a Whole Foods or like a Starbucks, it's too late. Um, and so large part of West Oakland is, is gone to gentrification. Uh, but there's pockets in a large part of what they call the Deep East, uh, which we like to think will never succumb to like the takeover. And a large part of that has to do with just the rebelliousness. The spirit of Oakland is like truly like rebellion. It's truly like um, nah, like N-A-H nah, straight up. And so I think in my work is is that same kind of thought, right? This idea of, um, you know, I'm going to write and, and kind of chronicle the things that I think are important and the things that matter to me, the people that look like me, and then the people that share similar experiences. Um, and so I think, yeah, a large part of 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 uh, my work is dedicated to to that rebelliousness. I mean, it birthed it birthed the Panthers, right? The Black Panthers, um, and, and a bunch of other kind of uh, you know rebellious organizations. Uh, so I think that's it, right? Like this idea, the spirit of of a rebelliousness, retribution, righteousness, and I think that. Uh, I strive to to include that in my work. Thanks for the question. What was your name one more time? Khalid. Thanks for the question, Khalid. Cool. What else? Uh, oh yeah, go for it. Oh, got one in the back, and then yeah, up here. Hi, I'm Julia. So when you say Oakland is changing, yeah. Aside from the gentrification, like who's pushing that change? Where's that change coming from? Yeah. Like, what are they trying to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, um, we live in America. America is a part of the Western world. The Western world heavily succumbs to capitalism, right? Which means everything that we do here uh, is about money, essentially. Um, Y'all live in the Silicon, or go to school in the Silicon Valley. Uh, it's too expensive to live here. So the next closest place is the East Bay. And so people are being pushed out of Oakland that have lived there for a long time, largely because rent is increasing, um, those properties that have been super lucrative um, the recent years, the folks are being pushed out of those homes so that folks that could afford them because they're CEOs of Apple and Google or like executives of these places are moving there, right? So it's really all about money in, in large part. Um, 
And it's beautiful, right? Like Oakland is a gorgeous place. It's right on the water, right? It's across the bay from San Francisco. So if you want like the touristy vibes, you can get there in 10 minutes without traffic, right? So not only is it a gorgeous place, but it's also 30 to 45 minutes away from the Silicon Valley, which is right now is the pinnacle of technology in, in media. Yeah. Cool. What else? Yeah, there's a question up here. Uh, if we can get the mic. Basically, what I was just wondering is, like, what draws you to a specific theme? Is it, like, life experiences or just things you, like, read or hear about? Yep. Or... Yep. Good question. So a lot of writers subscribe to the, um, I guess, the rule or the thing of um, what can you not remain silent about? So, for example, the poem that I started with, O to, my, o to Elijah, um, the thing I couldn't remain silent about was that my nephew wasn't being told that he was beautiful or gorgeous or intelligent, right? And so I had I had to, as a writer, because a writer's duty is to tell the truth, I had to kind of address, write about, talk to, wrestle with that thing. Um, so sometimes it's that. Other times um, I really enjoy music. Um, I respond to a lot of music. Uh, my second collection of poems, this joint right here, uh, Mausoleum of Flowers, has a lot of has a through line um in conversation with Frank Ocean. Um and so it's it's really just what's moving me, what's speaking to me, um and what what I can't remain silent about uh in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh there's a question right in the middle. Um since becoming a poet, how's your demeanor changed as a person? Um like before um, embracing the art of poetry, yeah. how have you changed since then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll show you what. Um, Ocean Vong, who's a, a phenomenal poet, um, Vietnamese poet, says, if you want to teach young people, you know, like kids, um, care, then you, you teach them poetry. And the reason is because poetry is the art form of caring for the small things, the small decisions. And so to answer your question, I would say like, it's taught me a patience, it's taught me a care um, for the small things, right? Um, it's taught me uh, to be like extremely um, like slow in, in my thoughts, in, in me wrestling, thinking about things. Um, and I also got, I got two daughters now. And so uh, amongst the, you know, the, the, the form of the, our form of, of caring for the small things, I've learned patience simply because like I have no choice now, right? Uh, with, with the littles. Um, yeah, so it's taught me care and patience. Yeah, what else? Um, yeah. My question is, what inspired you to become a poet? Like, did you always knew, yep. know that this is what you wanted to do or yep. was there a specific event? Love it. I was hoping someone would ask this question. My nephew is here in the room. I won't, I won't blow his, you know, blow up his spot. He's in the front here. Uh, his name is Miles, who is a student at San Jose State. His mother, who was my oldest sister, so I have uh, three older sisters. I have no brothers. Um, so I'm the baby, the only boy. So in a lot of ways, it was like, and I never met my father. So it was like growing up with four black moms. So if you ever grew up with like one black mom, like multiply that by four. Anyways, the oldest of them, her name is Tanisha Smith. She is a writer, poet, and her and I are the closest, I would say, or were the closest growing up. Um, she, uh, like I said, is a poet. And when I was in the seventh grade, um, she had just gotten married um, uh, to her now ex-husband uh, and moved to New York. Now, again, we're really close. Um, and so I was heartbroken, of course, right? But she left behind this photo album of poetry that she wrote while she was in high school. One of the poems she wrote that I still remember vividly to this day is called Wishing Upon a 747. And it's basically about her realization that um, she was not wishing on a star, but a jet airplane because stars aren't visible from the inner city because of light pollution and all that, right? And so coming to that as like this 11, 12 year old fledgling kid, body changing, mind changing, trying to figure out like what I wanna do, who I am, um, it was like the vector, right? So finding the poem was like, yo, wow, like words can do this, a story can do this, narrative can do this. And so um, that was half of the story. The second half is in the ninth grade. So fast forward a little bit in the ninth grade, I had a teacher named Mr. Ross, uh, English teacher. We did a unit on poetry. So we got to read poems, write our own poems and then share our poems. Um, 
the next day after that unit on poetry, Mr. Ross pulled me aside after class. He gave me two things. He gave me uh, the first novel I ever read from cover to cover, which is called The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Betty. And he gave me a blank journal and wrote inside the cover, so much talent never wasted. And so um, usually like the past five, six years when I you know, go places and lecture or speak, um, I'll say, I'll start by saying, if anybody knows Justin Ross, let me know or let him know I'm looking for him because I wanna thank him, right? Um, I'm happy to announce that I actually finally got in contact with Mr. Ross as of like two months ago. He shot me an email. I was like, yo, I heard you were looking for me. And um, I was like, yeah, I've been looking for you for years. But basically, um, he's a large part of why I decided to continue writing poetry. So my sister was, I think, the initial spark. Justin Ross, my English teacher, was a large part of the motivation. And I'll lastly, I'll say, I like to think I was born a poet, right? James Baldwin says, you don't you don't become a writer, you don't become a poet, like you're you're born one and you discover that and then you decide to do that or, or nothing else. And um, so I like to think that, that I was kind of born a poet and it just took my sister and Mr. Ross to kind of bring it to fruition. Yeah, cool. Hi again. Um, so I know you touched about this, uh, you touched on it earlier. Mm -hmm. So what makes a poet? So if I make one poem, am I a poet? Um, what attitudes do I have to have as a poet? I yeah. know you talked about aesthetics versus, you know, truth telling, being frustrated with something, right? Yeah. So, can you just tell me, like, what you think a poet should have, like, characteristics? No. How do I become a poet? I, I cannot tell you that. But what I can tell you is that um, a poet is more than just like something you do, right? It's more than just the act of writing. In fact, um, the act of writing is more than just like fine text, right? Uh, oftentimes when I'm struggling to write a poem, I'll take a walk. Um, my grandfather was a carpenter. I'm going to answer your question, I promise. My grandfather was a carpenter. Um, and oft, I like to say like that means he can make magic with his bare hands. And so um, one summer, actually many summers, I would ask him to build me a go-kart. Um, and of course, he's busy, right? He's a carpenter doing stuff, building stuff, doing stuff, right? Um, so this, this one summer, I finally asked him and he said, you want a go-kart? Okay, here's what you do. He says, you see that two by four over there? Go get it, bring it over here. So I grabbed the two by four. He says, you see the shopping cart in the gutter? Go roll that over here. He says, um, uh, go get the milk crate that's inside the house. Then he says, go get your least favorite pair of shoes uh, and bring them back here. He says, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna chop that two by four into three pieces. It's gonna make the front and rear axle. And then the center bar, you're gonna cut the front of that milk crate and set it on the crossbar of the back. Um, we're gonna detach the wheels from that shopping cart you rolled over, slap those on the sides, and then the shoestrings, take them out of the shoes and attach them to the front axle. And that's how you're gonna steer. And so um, I say all that to say, that was my introduction to craft. That was my introduction to resourcefulness as it relates to making something out of nothing. And so now when I think about being a poet, um, I think about what it means um, to exist in the world and to see different pieces and how those pieces I uh, can use as tools to make sense of something. And so to directly answer your question, being a poet, um, is is about a way of operating, thinking, always being in quest of the truth, um, and carrying yourself and doing the work of excavation that's required um, as as being a poet, right? And my grandfather teaching me how to build a go kart, ironically, was how I learned how to do that, right? And so um, most people are like, yo, poets are like these weird people who go sit in a room quietly somewhere in the woods and like write in their journal. And I'm like, nah. Poets are like walking amongst you right now. Poets are, I build, you know, I build go-karts. I built my daughter a bed. Um, I refinished like a kitchen table. All those things go into how I kind of see, view, and operate and write poems, right? It's all fed, right? Because a poet has to be a part of the world and the world is all the things that we experience um, collectively, right? So it's a collective experience that you have to embody, right? As a person, as a thinker. Yeah. Does that suffice? Is that make enough sense? Cool. All right. What else? Uh, in many uh, Bay Area classrooms, uh, obviously, uh, Black people are the in the minority around this area. Yep. Uh, so does that have any uh, impact on uh, your uh, lectures and how you uh, speak to your audiences or no or yeah? 
kind of like- short answer is no everybody needs to hear the truth right uh the longer answer is i went to a pwi uh, for undergrad and then i went to a pwi private school for for graduate school and um my orientation for undergrad uh let me take that back so i went to laney college and i played football there and then i broke my collarbone and then um I hung up the cleats and then I transferred to a PWI orientation at that school. I was the only black person in the room. Uh, and then, like I said, in grad school, I was one of two black people in the program. Um, and so I've experienced that my whole life. And early on, of course, it was tough to navigate. Right. Um, you suppress yourself. You get imposter syndrome. Uh, you think, do I belong here? Right. Um, but what I had to realize is when I was doing those things, then I was slowly killing not only myself, but as a writer, you're killing your your language, your way of communicating, your way of languaging. And so I had to learn to be really, as Oakland would say, right, rebellious, righteous um, and say nah to like that that kind of atmospheric kind of pressure and um, and to speak and write in the truth that 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 was for me. Um, so it took work. It's not an easy thing, especially again when the numbers are against you. Um, so so hang in there, folks that that feel that way, um, and persevere, like Kendrick Lamar said in Smile. I mean, and I, um, yeah, cool. Give us. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to. I guess I wanted to ask, um, for you personally, what would constitute good poetry versus bad poetry? Oh, man, I hate this question. Uh, you know, I'll say this. I'm not going to answer your question because, I, I, you know, that's, that's really judgy, right? Like, who knows? All this is really subjective. Um, poets win prizes for poems, and you might rock with it. Other people may not, right? So a lot of it is subjective. But what I will say is a poem should move you, right? As a reader, after I read a thing, I should be moved. Now, poems aren't gonna move everybody, which is where the subjectivity comes in. But I would say if you read a poem and you're moved by it, even if you don't understand it, right? That's another like little nugget, y'all. You don't have to understand a poem. Poems are not things that you have to decode or try to like fully understand. Just like you hear songs and the, the beat, the melody, the music, the chorus, the hook, speaks to you, you feel something, there's a mood, there's a vibe there, a poem can do the same thing. And that's a mark of a good poem. If it moves you, if you feel something, or if you're inspired by it, that's the mark of a good poem, right? Um, bad poems are the ones that don't tell the truth. That's all I can say about, about a bad poem. Yeah, good question. Thanks for asking. What else? Anything else? Dr. Summerhill, thanks for bringing it. Yeah. But I know you would. Yeah. <laughs> um, the assignment, the final assignment, is for them to write their own narratives. Fresh. Of course, they've been introduced to this genre of poetry yeah. because it's quick and easy to digest. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's got layers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me qualify that. Mm -hmm. um, but they have to tell their own story. Mm -hmm. So I'm really zeroing in on the fact that you're just talking about telling your truth. Yeah. Which is really important. What other kind of advice do you have for all the students as they step into this project? So part of the project is telling their own narrative, mm -hmm. making it relevant to the world that we live in, mm -hmm. the realities that they face. And we get a little smattering of history throughout, mm -hmm. not all of it, but you know, what we can cover in a semester. Sure. Um, and then there's gonna be an artistic part to that, an illustrative, part to that yeah so give them some advice sure so firstly use the, the simplest language you can right so poetry is the art form of concision and economy right so saying the most with the least amount of language <clears throat> so don't try to be super poetic right in short is what that means secondly um because memory fails us often um talk to your folks right talk to your elders your parents your grandparents 
your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, older cousins, et cetera, because they might be able to piece together pieces of your own story that you might not remember. Uh, and along those same lines about memory, we don't always remember uh, facts, right? But we do remember um, the way we felt during particular time periods. So try to channel and remember and think about the way you felt, the emotional kind of tones uh, in those places and connect with and, and try to tap into that as opposed to trying to get the facts straight, right? Um, and then lastly, uh, think about, um, again, your audience and how uh, the audience might feel after reading the piece. Right. So that's to say um, the truth, of course, is, is the best way to get about that. Right. But also don't try to embellish or, again, try to be too poetic. What is the core, the center of whatever you're after? Usually that stems from a centralized image or metaphor or some centralized kind of uh, theme, right? A thing that happened, right? And have everything else point back to and wrestle with whatever that centralized metaphor image theme might be. Right. And again, using the most simple um, of language, but really talk to your folks. I talked to my grandfather a lot more um, when he was like 80 plus than I did prior to that. And I really regret that because those 10 years when I did talk to him, so many stories, so rich. Right. I learned so much simply from engaging with him and learning his story and in turn where I come from. Right. My lineage and who I am. Um, and so talk to your folks, right? Like talk to the people that might have more, more knowledge, more memory, right? Of the things that, that, that are you, um, than you, than you have. What else? Oh, get outside in the world too. Um, don't just try to sit behind a computer. That's tough, right? The blank page is a terrible, terrifying experience, right? So usually like when you have trouble writing or starting writing something, you have to like go out into the world and like experience people watch, uh, listen to the birds, the sounds, the cars, I guess here, right? The, the, the coffee machine, the espresso machine at the cafe, get into the world, right? And usually that, that'll spark or jar something for you. Sorry? Come to events. Yeah, be inspired. Read, read, and read, read, and then read some more. Yeah, you can't write without reading. Um, so, so read. Find something you like. I know. I didn't read a full book, like I said, until the ninth grade. And then after that, I thought like books were terrible for another couple of years because um, I was exposed to books I wasn't interested in. Right. That's not to say I hated reading. That's to say I hated the things that were you know, presented to me. So find things that you find interesting and engaging and read those things and then be inspired and try to um, write your own stuff. Cool. Yeah. We can also talk about how the Warriors are going to win the championship this year. That's that's cool, too. Here we go. My favorite band book. You know, I'm not privy to the list of band books, but <clears throat> many of the books that I, I love <clears throat> that will probably probably be banned, um, anything by James Baldwin, especially his collections of essays, No Name in the Street. Um, uh, there's a collection of uh, interviews um, uh, called Black Women Writers at Work, edited by Claudia Tate. It's probably on the band list somewhere. Um, what else? Uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed is probably banned. Uh, yeah. Toni Morrison stuff, which is so wild. That seems sacrilegious like, to like ban Toni Morrison. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, that's all I can muster up right now. Yeah. Okay. I understand there's books. Um, if you grab a book, I'd love to sign it for you. And if you also want to just like come and rap about, like I said, Frank Ocean's Blonde album, we could do that or um, or anything else. I'm super approachable down to earth. So come say hi if you, you know, if you wish. Um, and thank you again for your time, your attention. Dean, thank you, Daniel, for your time. Carmen for arranging and Rahel for moderating. <laughs> um, we have two more programs tomorrow. Please join us at 1030 in 255 for comic books, bands, and activism. Presentation by three SJSU professors and scholars. Followed by that, we have Universal Themes in Life and Literature with James Cagney and Shaka Campbell, which is part of our Unbanned Author Speaker Series at 330, also in that room. Thanks, guys. <laughs>